everyone. I am Zing from SG Innovate. We are a government-owned organization that invests in and helps build deep tech startups that leverage science and technology to make lives better for all. For today's event on the Aegis Race for Quantum Computing, we are very grateful to our partners, Center for Quantum Technologies and IBM for helping to bring together our panel of experts to discuss about the quantum computing landscape with a focus on Asia. Without further ado, let me invite Victor, SG Innovate's Director of Venture Investing and our moderator for today to start the session. Victor, please. Here we go. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, and welcome to uh, this morning's session of uh, uh, the race in Asia for, for quantum computing. Um, this is a super exciting topic around, you know, why we believe that, that quantum computing, firstly, you know, is, is, is crucial and important, you know, for, for, for our lives and, uh, and what's happening around the region um, for it, right? And, and is there really a race? You know, do we need a race? You know, I, and today, I think we, we have uh, three really awesome people uh, that, that, have, that come from the right background with the right amount of knowledge to share uh, about this with us. Uh, and, and I'm super excited to learn about this with them. Uh, and let me introduce our three speakers. Uh, we have uh, Norishige Morimoto, who is the Chief Technology Officer and Vice President at IBM Research and Development in Japan. We have Peter Guess, who's our freelance technology journalist, and he's, he's, he's seen a lot, way more than, than, than I have, you know, around what, what quantum technology will, will bring uh, um, to, to our society. Uh, we also have Dimitris uh, Angel Angelakis, who is a Principal Investigator, Center for Quantum Technologies in Singapore, and Associate Professor at the Techn Technical University of Crete. Welcome, gentlemen, uh, to today's discussion. And uh, I want to uh, just have some uh, hygiene for um, uh, uh, our our participants. So during this session, you know, you might you might come across areas that you want to have you want to ask questions about. You know, so so I will uh, advise you to not um, ask those questions on the chat the chat box that you see below. Uh, please put those in the Q and A. So what, what I'll be doing is I will be re reviewing the questions, and uh, we will be leaving that right to the end. Uh, where we will pose those questions to the three speakers. So let's let's get this started. Um, so let's 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 start with the background, right? Um, around kind of like you know uh, uh, where we are today, and 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 what what is what is quantum, you know, um, um, uh, making the news in currently, right? And I think I think uh, um, Nori San uh, said this in one of Peter's articles, which is you know a new era of computing beckons as different from today's computing as computers are from the abacus. This is a huge claim, right? I mean, talking about, talking about you know, a, a fundamentally new paradigm of looking at, at computation. So, can, so would you guys like to share kind of like what is this new e era that we're in and, and why is it so different? A anyone? Um, okay. <laughs> Maybe not um, Lisa, so, since you said yeah, this. Right? <laughs> let, let, me, let me start. So hi, everyone. Um, thank you. My name is Noli Morimoto from IBM. And um, well, I, I get involved to uh, the quantum computer actually um, since about five years ago. But um, oh, at first, I, I'm uh, I'm so sorry, I forgot to get you guys to do your introductions. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So sorry. So maybe maybe as uh, since since you started, please uh, go ahead to do that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, I figured out so that I started with my introduction. So um, Noli Morimoto, I manage the um, IBM uh, Research and Development, and also the Chief Technology Officer in Japan. And uh, previously, actually, I was stationed in Singapore uh, for a couple of years, uh, working as a CTO of Asia Pacific. And um, during that time, I uh, heard about this exciting project happening. In fact, the first touch of uh, this topic was uh, um, near the 2006 in uh, IBM uh, Yorktown Heights headquarters that I just figured out that we have this exciting project going on. Um, well, at that time, it was uh, super um, confidential and um, prior proprietary uh, managed uh, environment. So I wasn't able to touch too much detail there. But since 2016, um, IBM started to open up this door um, by, um, you know, letting people to access this quantum computer. So I uh, started to get into much deeper, uh, including my research team in Tokyo. Um, you know, we started the projects and working with the Keio University to set a hub here, hub in Japan, and um, start to, um, you know, get more excited about that. But I think, you know, I'm looking forward to the, the discussion of this. But I guess just one word about the, um, the uh, opportunity of this whole new tools is I should say that this is a fundamentally um, different 
tools that uh, compared to what we have as a classical computers. And everything starting from the very um, tiny little um, unit we call qubit are already different. You know, the classical computer based on the switch one and zero, it's one, either one or zero, but in the quantum computer, it's a one and zero, and that's just one effect of that. You know, and we also utilizing a lot of the quantum effects called superposition, entanglement, uh, interference, all those things actually came together um, to be able to manipulate the, uh, those bits and qubits uh, in a much more dramatic uh, and variety of uh, ways. And that will allow us to conduct a lot of the computations um, that wasn't possible uh, with classical computer then, which we expect that will open up a great opportunity for many, many uh, industries that is gonna touch on this new technology. Thank you, Donishit. Thank you, Donishit. Um, Peter, can I get you to introduce yourself? Uh, tell us, you know, uh, how you got started with quantum, you know, and, uh, and I'll, I'll go after that to Dimitris. Sorry, I, I was too excited just now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Victor. Um, so as I said, um, my name is Peter Guest. Uh, I tend to introduce myself as a sort of a technology journalist because uh, I come at it at a slightly strange angle. So I don't really write about the nuts and the bolts and, and the apps and so on. Uh, I tend to look at how technology intersects with society. Um, which is kind of how I got to quantum. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a homecoming for me because I studied physics at university and then let it lapse and forgot most of it, but always found myself drawn to quantum in particular because of the elegance of how it describes complex ideas. Um, and, and actually, what I'll say is partly actually to answer your first question there, which is what's drawn me back into it professionally and, and, it, and had me write more stories about it and, and certainly do more research on it is that it's quite a present conversation, the need for something that is a step change, the fundamental change in the way that we model systems. Um, if 2020 sorts anything, as why we're sitting here on a Zoom call rather than in real life, is that we live in a world of very complex problems. Yeah. Climate change and the need to make energy networks more efficient, you know, design better cities, design better materials, model extreme weather, model pandemics. Uh, aging, antibiotic resistance, all of these terrifying things are enormously complex and, and we need ways to fix them. And quantum computing is one of those things that's kind of been hovering in the background as a solution. And as those problems get more pressing, there's more conversation about it. Um, and that's why I get drawn back into it. Um, the second thing, which I'm sure we'll talk about some more, is that if you're a technology journalist or a source of technology journalist right now, one of the, the most important trends is the, is the kind of strategic competition. So you're talking today, if you look on the news today, you'll see how a telecoms infrastructure company has become the vector for great power competition. So we'll talk about it, you know, the Asia race for quantum computing. There's a lot of talk of arms races. It's not a phrase I like, but there's a lot of analogs with the Cold War around the financing and support of technologies that give real or perceived strategic edge. And, you know, you go and talk to people in the US defense establishment and they get very excited about this. So that also was kind of brought it from the science pages onto the front pages, which is you know, how I ended up being sucked back in. Thank you, Peter. Dimitris. Right, um, so I'm Dimitris Angelakis. I'm a professor in um, Singapore in the Center for Quantum Technologies, a principal investigator. We're investigating quantum things, uh, as you know. Um, just a brief uh, buy on me. I did my PhD back in uh, Imperial College almost 20 years ago. Wo then worked in Cambridge University as a researcher for total almost 10 years in UK. And then I moved to Singapore 10 years ago to, to lead a group in quantum computing and quantum simulation at CQT. So the stuff we're doing in my group is basically algorithm software and and, and collaborating with experimentalists, the hardware people as well, to, to get something useful out of those machines that were being built at the moment. Um, how did I get started with uh, quantum? Actually, I didn't know quantum until I entered university. I loved relativity as a kind of high school student. I was reading the brief history of time and all this exciting stuff. So I thought like, you know, what the hell with it, I'll become a physicist. Everybody said, go and become a medic or an engineer because you're gonna make more money, you're a good student. But, you know, I was living um, in the countryside in Greece in the mountains of Crete. And I said, you know, let's, let's do physics. And then, and then quantum physics came in the university. I have to say the way that it arrived in the university was not the optimal way. And this is something we're trying to change as well. Maybe we can discuss about this later on, mm -hmm. how do we educate people in quantum in the proper way? 
Mm-hmm. And uh, one thing led to another, and um, and um, uh, you know I got caught up. My my PhD was we can say in the beginning of this quantum revolution twenty years ago. Um, very very different times then. Smaller field. Now we are kind of uh, expanding at uh, the speed of light, which is a good and a negative thing. We can discuss a little bit both sides later. And just to wrap up on the earlier discussion, especially brought up by Norisan, quantum is exotic. Quantum is, um, I would say, I would kind of half disagree with you, Norisan, with all respect. Actually, quantum, um, the abacus and classical computers are very close to each other. It's just that the classical computers calculate much faster. They still calculate one by one and so on. Quantum is completely different. So this is a disruptive, this is a leap. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's very, um, we can't put it in words because it's quantum, basically. So that's that's that's. <laughs> a, but I agree with Noel San that uh, at least in the beginning, the distance between speeds and performances will be similar. But mm. there's more to it. And, and and that's the thing about quantum. Thank you, Demetrius. Right. Um, uh, and that's the thing about quantum. The one thing that 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 everyone has an issue is how, how do we describe quantum, right? Without having to go into into the nuts and bolts, right? Is is it possible? And and I think that is one of the the key challenges in terms of introducing it to to new people and to new and and, the, and when I say new people, I do mean industries. I do mean people who are going to fund it. I also do mean the governments who, who are who are attempting to to make use of it, right? So, so I think uh, um, um, one of the one of the things that people need to understand is what are some of the the potential breakthroughs that that people. So, so if I can't understand the technology, maybe can you explain to me what are the potential breakthroughs that the technology can bring to me and society? Right, and, and it, it would only be possible with quantum. Gentlemen, <laughs> maybe let's, let's go the other way. Uh, Peter, you, you're smiling quite brightly. <laughs> let's, let's get some perspectives from you. <laughs> I mean, I'd say that I'm probably the least qualified on the panel to, to make that call. Um, maybe, maybe we can come back around to it later on when we talk about the, the, um, the practical side of it, but I think maybe I'll, okay. I'll defer to my colleagues on that one. Okay. Um, Noli I'll, I'll, I'll give you this. Sure. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Go for it. Yeah, so it, um, again, I would love to answer that question. If I knew that question, maybe I would, um, I would leave my professorial hat and start a, a, a big company. Uh, but um, let's say that, um, um, okay, the first thing with terms of speed and, and processing power, right? So, so um, we expect to have applications in, in in hard to simulate problems at the moment. And we have very good cases, uh, especially in chemistry, which relates to drug design. And this is very contemporary as well with the pandemic going on. Um, then, then at optimization problems, logistics, these are also very hard problems that cannot really be cracked down by normal computers. We expect to have some um, applications there and when we say logistics, this is very big. Energy management was mentioned earlier by Peter. Um, uh, traffic um, coordination and many other things. Um, and then also in the area of data analytics, machine learning, we see we see some uh, applications there. All there's a lot to be done still. Mm. But just to kind of wrap it up again, it's like asking Alan Turing in the in the fifties to predict the iPhone. So. There's going to be a lot of stuff that we cannot even imagine, I think. And, and, and time is compressed now. Time is not, it, it took 20 or 30 years from Alan Turing to get the machines. Mm. I think for us, it will be a five to 10 year max horizon. And, and um, it's good to record this video to go back 10 years down the line and see how, what is the fidelity, as we say, between what we say and what will be out there. I expect to be very small, but. Mm-hmm. but. Yeah, Dimitri, I like that. Um, analogy that you know, talk about the predicting the future. And I completely agree that, um, you know, I'm very sure that there, there will be a, a lot of applications that we cannot imagine today is going to happen after the quantum is evolving. And uh, speaking of the application side, I think there are two ways to look at this. And one is that look at this, um, the practical side. Um, practical side, most of the computer science today is uh, thinking of hard problems today they are put in in the supercomputer and expecting the quantum computer can take over some of those workloads in much faster and easier way. 
And uh, that's the, those areas, uh, such as Dimitri explained, um, is in the quantum chemistry, which is actually using a lot of the models and supercomputer power resources to simulate the molecular, even few of them. And uh, with quantum computer, we expect that the, those exponentially scaling problems can be done uh, on quantum much easier. That's one way. The other way is like financial risk analysis. When you have a one, even one portfolios is fluctuating and have a lot of uh, opportunity, you know, um, possibilities in the futures, um, then that just one element um, is already a pretty uncertain element. And imagine you can have a thousands of thousands of those uncertain elements in trying to calculate the total risk is a mess. Mm -hmm. And that kind of activity is what the people today imagine or expecting the quantum computer can take over and ease the task. Uh, that's one area. And because I, I still think that is, um, you know, classical people using non-classical tools. Now, more interesting thing will happen when non-classical people grow up with non-classical tools. And that is really the our true innovation is happening, which we think, you know, we can just dream now. But um, for example, many of the things that we cannot solve or even model, uh, for example, things happening in the tiny little leaves, mm -hmm. optical synthesis, you know, of the energy, right? Those kind of things is all, all we dream of and uh, which is still not perfectly 100% understood Therefore, we cannot rebuild it. Um, maybe with quantum physics or quantum computers combined, one day we can have better understanding about that to the level that we can reproduce that magical activities, right? So there are many tons of things like that, but today we can only imagine. So um, in my perspective, there are two. One is that uh, real, uh, a little more organically um, imagine territories and areas that for industry application. The other is more like a future um, you know, what to expect uh, from the next generation of so-called quantum native generations. So I, I, I really love, you know, the, what you just said about non-classical people growing up with non-classical tools, right? And, and I think that's something that, that yeah, I'll, I'll, but the boundaries of our imagination are about that much, right? So, so I, I think, I think, I think this, this is a key differentiation. And I'll bring that up again later when we talk about the talent, when we talk about you know, how we're going to grow the community. Uh, Peter, you had something to, to add? Yeah, I was going to say actually, yeah, so it's, it's fantastic to hear that what the, the kind of unknowns, what future may come for us. But I think when you talk to people who are thinking now about coming into the field for the first time as investors, as supporters, as funders, and so on, you know, it, it's, they're not at that level yet. And I think one of the, the applications that we talk about, I think we have to root them a little bit more practically. And when, when I look at deep tech, I tend to look at it in three ways. Like there's things that people want, there's things that people need, and there's things that people are scared of. And I think probably you need to find the intersection of those things. So AI and machine learning, we are scared of it. We don't really understand it. Um, people probably want it, but we haven't really explored the, the full app application of, of AI using classical computers yet. It's not its potential, so it's probably not there. Um, cryptography, everyone is terrified of. Like a bank is terrified of the fact that you can crack their, their, their albums. But they're not going to do anything about that just yet because it's, it's not really, they don't really need it, they don't really want it just yet. Um, public goods, you know, we talked about energy, we talked about cities. Who's going to pay for that? You know, it's, a, it's, it's not something that's going to be done philanthropically just yet. So, so I'll come back to, to, to actually what Nanu San was saying uh, earlier, which is that probably you have to find that overlap. And that overlap is, I would say, where people what we want, as in people will invest in it, what we need and the society will accept it and what they're frightened of in the sense it'll be disruptive is chemistry. It's pharmaceutical molecules and it's material science. Because if you don't get involved in this now, you could be disrupted quite profoundly. It gives you an immediate edge uh, and you want to invest in it. That's, my, that's what I would think. And, and, and I think that, that's a, a super great segue into, you know, the next part of, of, of this uh, question, which is like the key challenges, right, that we are facing in, in, this, in this era of quantum, right? While we, while we as, 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 you know, uh, industry practitioners would like to push quantum as quickly as possible, there are existing issues, you know, uh, as, what you, as what you have all brought up um, exist, right? And how do we find the intersection? And, and, and some of the key challenges in, in my mind, as I, as I, as I work in looking at investing in companies and looking at the landscape, uh, I have four in my mind, you know, um, and, and would love to hear if, if what you guys are think are, are some of the other bigger issues. I, I think about timeline. I think about, you know, how, how do we think about quantum development of timeline? Is it too long, 
right? And because it's so long, how do we balance, you know, research and commercialization, right? Uh, because after a while, of people throwing money into it and, and researchers working on it, if there's no practical outcome that comes out of it, people get, you know, just kind of you know, like, what am I doing this for, right? And, and that leads to financing, right? Who, who will keep financing this, this, this bid for us to, to reach the next generation of computational power? And, and finally, you know, talent, right? Which is one of the biggest challenges all across the technology field. How do we keep uh, ensuring that there's a proper pipeline of talent that comes into the quantum space? So um, we'd love to hear some of your thoughts around, you know, beyond these four, you know, what are some of the other challenges? And then, you know, are there, are there practical um, ways to, 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 uh, for us to address it? Yeah, so maybe I, I can uh, comment that from, uh, since we're the um, private company, um, you know, making money, and investing in this area for a long time. And there must be some reason to do that. Yep. And uh, in our case, maybe I'll start with the motivation. Um, so one of the very important motivation is the necessity of the computing resources. Um, you know, until 10 years ago, uh, people think that, uh, you know, if co uh, computer semiconductor keep growing, like with, along with the Moore's law, right? And every 18 months you get, get the double uh, up of your upscale, your computer resources, um, which become almost free, right? And so there's no need for innovation for hardware. That was uh, some people mentioned that make that statement um, about 10 years ago or so. But guess what? What happened is that when you see AI, data science, computing resources, actually the necessity of the computing resource grow even faster than that. Every 12, 12 months, um, the world of the computer needs is growing 2x. So that is outpacing the growth of our computing hardware in the world. So there will be the gap uh, coming up. And there's more data generated, more need for AI and computing resources, but we cannot catch up with that if we only have the technology for the classical computers uh, and follow the Moore's law. So there's a big necessity. And uh, within IBM, we started about uh, 10, 12 years ago um, to explore a lot of those uh, potential opportunities and uh, options. And one of them being quantum computers. Mm -hmm. And although, you know, I will not declare that success, um, you know, right away or an immediate business opportunity for this, but as long as we have a necessity, you know, if not quantum, there's something else has to happen. So that's what uh, I think the, uh, from the motivation side, it's not just like a cool technology pop up or out of nowhere, if this is no use, then people will not invest it. But there's a certain necessity of this and uh, needs for that. So that's, that's one. And I think, so that's why we'll continue. Um, although it will end up in this quantum computer we have today or totally different uh, option, you know, that you know, it will happen. And uh, the other is uh, important thing is that uh, connecting to the real business needs, what we have just discussed about all those, um, you know, needs and how quick we can get there. And I think the important thing is that how much we know about the quantum computer today and how much it can do now. Right? And then so that it, with the many hardware companies uh, like us is uh, working on that and trying to bring up the capacity of the quantum computers. Um, you know, those people who are touching and playing with today's computer will know that what will happen in when approximately. Right? So that will include some of those uh, very early phase of the applications of chemistry or mathematics or maybe in the finance areas. Um, and some of those useful uh, application, I'm sure that will happen uh, in about five years or so time, time frame. Not everything, but you know, some useful applications. Yep. yep. I can add to that, uh, if, if I may. Um, I definitely agree the necessity and, and and to put some numbers on Morrison's um, um, point on, on, on the growth of data, we are producing like 2.5, 2.7 exabytes of data per day. So what that means is like 5 million laptops, 5 million laptops a day. Or if you've been to the US to the Library of Progress, is a massive library, it's 250,000 libraries a day. And this is, this is data we upload on the internet, this is, stuff on our uh, emails, this is documents we save. And on the other hand, our classical tools are saturating. I mean, the, the Moore's law is there. We can't make chips smaller than we, we can at the moment because of the quantum effects. There's quantum noise there. And, and 
where in terms of computing power, we see a plateau. I mean, all big uh, hardware, classical hardware companies, Intel, AMD, they, if you see the top of the range, the last three to five years is kind of plateauing. So we need something else. Mm. And quantum is the, the cause of the trouble, but it's also if you flip it upside down, provides a new solution. So this is, this is where we are now. Mm. Now, um, the challenge is to get it done, to build it. I mean, the theory is there, the algorithms work all the way from uh, Peter Shaw's and Grover's algorithm 25 years ago in my, in my graduate years to more advanced and developed and applied algorithms these days that do optimization or they, they solve linear equations or they do all kinds of other things or do chemistry. We know the math. The math is there, it's correct, it works. Getting the hardware to the level that can actually implement those algorithms is a bit of a challenge, but it's a technological channel. There's no no go theorem. There's no forbidden um, uh, law from physics that forbids us to build this. So mm. it should be built. Of course, then this is where the money questions and the funding you said. If if somebody comes to us to CQT or to to to, to any other institution and say, look, I'll fund you as big as CERN. I'll throw a few billion dollars. Uh, for the next uh, two to three years or five years, are you going to build an operating quantum computer? The answer is uh, probably we'll give it a very good shot. I mean, it's, uh, it's a different scale of things. So, mm. uh, and, and, and quantum field is not there yet. Yeah. So we don't have that kind of visibility or, or volume. It, we're, getting, we're getting bigger, but mm. you know, we're not funded like, like accelerators. And, and high energy physics. So this is this makes a big difference, I think. So, um, agree. And 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 I think that that that, that is a, a um an interesting point to note, especially as we go into the next part of, of, of our of our segment, right? Which is which is you know uh, um this 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 so called race, right? This race for 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 you know being the lead in, in quantum, right? And and you know uh, uh Dimitris and and uh, and uh, Norisan, you guys brought up very relevant points in terms of. Of, of the practical applications, you know, and, and uh, Dimitris, you know, uh, I think it's also about how, how do we, how do we start attracting some of them, some of that money in, in, into research, right? And at the same time, you know, um, how, how does the research contribute to, to, the, to the commercial side? Like all these guys are already pumping money from, from so, sort of organizations such as, you know, IBM, Google, everyone's pumping, you know, their own bottom line into, into research in these areas. At the same time, how do the uh, uh, educational organizations, you know, such as such as CQT, help to augment or, or, or help to enhance that kind of work, right? Because because I would assume a lot of this work is not shared, right? So there's definitely you know some silos. Uh, everyone wants to be on the edge, and and, I, and and while we we all agree that there needs to be more more collaboration, definitely there is some level of of, of secrecy amongst amongst organizations. Right? So I think I think uh, the next question, right, and 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 uh, um, building up on what you guys are, are discussing is. Who do you believe are the key play, key leading players globally, right? Um, in the in the quantum space, you know, and specifically for uh, for today's topic in Asia, right? Um, and and why and why do you believe quantum is important to these players, right? Is it a, is it a matter of diversification of, of, of their offerings, or is it, is it just future proofing? A future proofing, you know, in other words, uh, and and you can talk about tech companies, corporations, research institutions, and startups and others. So um, we'd love to hear what, what you guys think, uh, who, who these leading players are. And, and later on, we'll talk about how, you know, how, how, how do we work together, right, uh, as a community. Well, um, maybe I should, I should start that, um, you know, I, I kind of uh, know, think that um, today's states um, is a bit too early to speak about, um, you know, the race, so to speak. Because uh, race meaning that you have uh, one very well-defined goal. And who will be the first to get there? That's the race. But instead of uh, putting analogy in the race, I should say that it's more like exploring the new world or a new continent, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there, there's no uh, one single sort of a predefined goals there. And, uh, but there, instead, there are a lot of very wide variety of the green field to be explored. So in that sense, I will actually um, welcome more competitors to come to play in that world. And so we'll find the place here and there, and then that will actually um, accelerate the, the, uh, the whole uh, development of these uh, technology fields. And in that sense, I think many of those uh, computer companies uh, that you mentioned already uh, put a lot of money there uh, exploring in 
kind of a very um, multiple dimensions, um, whether that's a different type of hardware approaches, um, different type of uh, algorithms. Um, but I think the, another areas, you know, so maybe that hardware or fundamental uh, technology uh, options um, would be one of the places that you can call the race, right? It's because we're competing each other scientifically. Um, but for the application side, what we need is clearly the um, uh, application and outcome that will generate some kind of the benefit or uh, you know profit to benefit to the industry or particular applications. As far as that is concerned, I think there's a still we're in the pre-competitive field, uh, either building the new quantum algorithms or building the platform uh, to everybody to share the open source um, you know knowledge or code that they have invented. In those areas, I think it's pretty competitive and that's, um, you know, broader uh, would be probably better. And in fact, the IBM is creating the community um, and also the open source repository called Quiskit mm -hmm. and open up to, um, you know, uh, close to, I think, the 240,000 um, subscribers uh, of that system already. And those people are, uh, you know, working on this system, either hardware or simulators, and generate a lot of code and algorithm ideas to be shared and then to boost that whole areas. So I think that is still in that, that um, uh, phase. Obviously, some of the companies will do proprietary work and uh, you know, either by, with, by themselves or with us, which I cannot talk publicly, um, you know, that do exist all the time. But um, I think their are significant part is still in the pre-competitive stage. Um, which um, you know will will we'll still welcome a lot of players to be playing um, in that field. Thank you. I may uh, add on that. Um, so uh, I think it's very important to stay open. It's too early to, and we do see signs that is going is closing down. Mm -hmm. um, it's going more preparatory. We would love to see more papers from IBM, by the way. Please tell your experimentalists to publish more. We'd love to see the details. I think it's important to, for the scientific teams at least, I'm still a scientist, I'm, I'm learning a little bit the bigger world these days, but I think it's very important that we share. The field will progress if knowledge, as in the scientific and academic world, is, is shared openly. We publish in journals, we read each other, we criticize each other with peer review, and this is how the field progresses. So. So far, quantum really started like this. I mean, quantum, what we call quantum hardware these days, it was um, quantum optics and atomic and molecular physics uh, a few years ago. There's the same kind of terminology or superconducting physics, if we talk about superconducting qubits. Uh, so all that kind of fundamental physics field that actually had a lot of hard problems solved the last 10 years to get into the level we are now. I would say maybe even five to 10 Nobel Prizes have been awarded the last 15 years mm -hmm. in, in, in fields that maybe most people now don't recognize, I mean, the bigger fields, in quantum optics, in laser cooling, in, um, in, in fields which are some very upstream, but actually allowed us to build this, this technology now that we can discuss about applications. So all that was possible because, you know, people were publishing and they were sharing, uh, sharing the knowledge. However, recently I see a trend um, uh, and it's probably natural when you have private investors and institutions coming in and they invest money. And on top of that, this is probably, we discuss later on, you have um, geopolitical issues and, and trade wars and mm. all these things coming up. It's probably unavoidable that some of this will be proprietary. Uh, I don't like it, but I think it will happen. Mm. Um, and and you, on your first question on the talent, because you mentioned what CQT as well, um, uh, how we deal with that. I think, again, um, it would be great to have billion of dollars, like CERN, but it's not really the money a problem anymore. I think now with the private sector coming in, probably money will be enough at some point. Mm. Is having enough educated people, trained people that can um, actually work in, in real quantum problems throughout the spectrum, upstream and downstream the applications. Mm. Uh, we need people everywhere. We need people to to sit down and think hard and understand quantum and come up with proper ways to improve the hardware and the, and the algorithms. But we also need people 
to go out and talk to industry and figure out what is the real problems that industry um, um, worries about. Because, yeah. you know, the gap between academia and industry sometimes is quite big. And, and that you need the workforce. We need to educate the workforce. In CQT, we, we, we do many things. We have a, a large PhD program for our size. We have like 100 or so PhD students graduated the last few years and we're still getting more. We, we have a lot of interns. Um, more recently, some of us are also getting interns from industry and there's kind of a osmosis both sides. Mm -hmm. um, uh, IBM is doing a lot in that direction as well. The, the, the training camps and we do similar uh, programming workshops, education, hackathons, and so on. So there's, there are things happening, but we have to grow that. And this is very yeah. important. Agree. Peter, as, a, <laughs> as an observer. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to weigh in here. Yeah, the, the, the I think it touches on both of this, uh, funding and also talent. Um, I mean, it, we alluded to it at the start. And in terms of the corporate race, it's, it's an easy narrative for us in the press, and it gives us some benchmarks that we can measure progress. But... Um, one of the things that I think is a big atmospheric issue is that there are certainly people in, in Washington and Beijing who believe they're in a race, uh, quite profoundly believe they are in a race. Um, I mean, I've spoken to people in the defense establishment in the US who compare developing a universal quantum computer to the H-bomb, you know? Um, they are in the minority. They're not, they're not, there isn't the kind of universal view, but, and cynically, some of them are saying it because they want funding, right? Um, but there becomes a self-fulfilling element to it. You know, if you think back into the 60s, 70s, the US and the Soviet Union spent millions of dollars researching, researching psychic powers. And they did that not because they believed in it, but they did it because the other side was doing that, mm. right? Um, and I think that it does become self-fulfilling and there will be a lot more money floating around. There'll certainly be more interest floating around. It may not be very informed interest. And it will ha undoubtedly have some impact on, on how talent moves around the world. Um, and just one last point on it, actually, is that a lot of it, we feel it's wound up with the current incumbent in the White House. And we think it's a 2016 thing. We think it's a 2020 thing. We think it's a, a trade war thing. But this predates that by easily six, seven years. Um, this is something which has been on the minds of, of particularly the American defense establishment and the Europeans and certainly the Chinese for a while. And um, these are big actors in funding tech. But you just have to bear it in mind, I think, that what that means in the future. Cool. Um, uh, you guys still haven't answered my question, so, <laughs> so I'm going to ask it again. Uh, so, so uh, not on a not on a competitive scale, right? But but perhaps you know, understanding who are the some of the leading organizations uh, are at the forefront, right? Especially in Asia, because 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 that, that's of interest to me personally, and and I really want to understand, you know, who are the who are who are the folks involved, and and how can we reach out to them, right, to actually connect the, the resources that we have, you know, with some of these organizations, uh, um, regionally at least, right? So. Would love to hear from 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 you know all three of you um, in terms of regionally. Who do you think are some of the organisations that are at the forefront uh, of quantum research and quantum uh, you know commercialization? Um, so I won't speak for others, <laughs> but um, if I speak, IBM. May, um, speak for IBM, um, is yes, certainly that we are um, we claim that uh, we are the most active uh, players uh, in this field. Um, we, uh, actually started, uh, 2016, open up the quantum on, um, the cloud, uh, for people to use. And now, uh, we grew the number of, uh, quantum computer offered to external players up to 22. Mm. So we just add, uh, six more, um, you know, highest, uh, quantum volume computers, um, last week, uh, in the last couple of weeks, uh, announce it. And so now it's a tw total 22 uh, quantum computers are, yeah. uh, you know, in service. And those uh, utilization are going up um, like 97%. Wow. wow. And uh, altogether, as I mentioned, uh, 240,000 users are having the uh, user account on this, uh, these machines. And um, accumulated uh, about the 200 billion times of access uh, and mm. already been done. And out of that, if you go to the publication, it's about the 240 uh, papers been published out of that uh, using those machines. And worldwide, we have uh, more than 110 uh, corporate members or university members participating in these research networks. Yep. So those are all, I think those numbers are fact numbers that we published outside. And um, I, I think there's no other players doing this much of a, at a scale. So um, in that sense that we open up, you know, several uh, sort of uh, um, hubs 
And uh, when we call hub, is that uh, for the academia body of institution as a sort of a center, hub of a center. And uh, with uh, some of the industrial players and uh, companies come to this uh, center mm -hmm. to conduct the research together. So this is kind of a um, industry and academia collaborative research. And of course, when we establish those center, IBM will also invest uh, the, uh, the funding as well as the, the people and researchers into that uh, particular hubs. Um, we have one uh, hubs uh, established 2018 in Japan uh, at the Keio University and uh, with uh, four member companies. Uh, one is a Mitsuho Bank, uh, the other is uh, Mitsubishi and BTMU and Bank of uh, Mitsubishi, Tokyo Mitsubishi Bank. And then there are Mitsubishi Chemical and uh, JSR, Japan uh, Special Rubbers Company. So those are four companies, they don't just uh, invest in money, they also put their researchers on this hub. So initially when we start, there was only seven researchers um, in 2018, May. Um, before one year, that center grew into 30 people, 30 scientists in there. And guess what? Those are two of the associate professors all become the full, full tenure professor in one year. That's actually pretty amazing for the small research group like this. So you can see that um, that is uh, very quickly evolving, which um, I think the Dimitri mentioned about which is a good or bad, right? Um, I mean, for the research, of course, that you have all of a sudden many people come to your lab and uh, start to, um, you know, throwing up a, a lot of things that it's not a good thing. But um, on the other hand, uh, for the scientists, to understand the future use case at mm -hmm. an earlier stage will actually help to drive that, accelerate the research. Mm -hmm. In that sense, IBM, we have um, you know, more than 100 institutions collaborating to uh, contribute to the input of those future use cases and to us. So our scientists and hardware researchers actually is hearing those input. And obviously uh, that will help us to design the future or next generation machines um, and, and uh, to narrow down the, the technological options and stuff like that. And so those are, I think it's a good move to, to do that. And some of the part, of course, we publish, uh, share with the community to drive up the whole platform. Um, some of them we have to keep it proprietary because, uh, you know, are funded by special source <coughs> that um, cannot be sourced, right? So that's yeah. <laughs> Thank that's you. Okay. Let me jump in as well, and okay. once we are, uh, we have a phrase in this saying, if you don't talk good about your house, it will collapse in your head. So let me, <laughs> uh, let me say as well that, uh, yeah, should sure, numbers speak, and, and CQT is 12 years old, um, uh, almost 13 now, you could call it a teenager, but maybe one of, uh, in, in, in quantum years is a senior in the sense that it was the first Quantum Center of Excellence in Southeast Asia. It's roughly 20 groups split between theory, experiment, and, and computer science. Uh, we think in terms of high level publications in the real upstream research, we have been leading the game, uh, at least in the area of Southeast Asia for some time. There's a big question now, um, how to expand and how to really move from being a basic science institution to also tackle the challenges that are coming in by the field growing and having all these industrial uh, questions yeah. coming in. There's various things um, being discussed. I was actually in the, in the discussion yesterday with our new director, Professor Latore, as well about this. You might be hearing some, some news. Um, to go back to the players in, in Asia, um, I mean, uh, globally, I think we discussed already, we have IBM here, of course, they're doing a lot of uh, work in some areas and um, Google is there all the big some private and smaller and bigger startups from um, different institutions JQI, IONQ for example uh, Europe is uh, traditionally was always very strong we had quantum in Cambridge probably 30 years ago when I was there as a um, uh, even before my, my PhD now um, in Asia we already mentioned a few um, um, uh, China, of course, is pushing a lot. Yeah. Uh, um, Beijing, um, Tsinghua University, um, um, and, and people that came back from Europe, uh, Professor Pan, Jiangwen Pan, in cryptography and satellites, um, they are doing quite a bit of work. This is an area we in CQT as well 
work quite actively. We have mini satellites, smaller, but more portable, and they can actually be very efficient as well. Mm -hmm. um, um, there is, uh, you might have heard about a new company in China, CTEC, that went to the stock market and suddenly blew up like, uh, I don't know, thousand percent a day. Let's see how it does in a few weeks. But again, this is again, I think government has packed, backed them up a lot. They work on crypto and so on, which also yeah. sold some um, uh, interface that you need private government kind of collaborations. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that um, uh, Tencent and Alibaba are also trying to enter. Baidu, uh, a colleague from Australia, went back to lead the theory effort. They don't have hardware. There are a lot of things happening and they do have a lot of cash. So there's going to be a lot mm -hmm. of competition. But I think in the number of people and getting trained people, this is where the game will be. Uh, yeah will be played so we, i feel that in in singapore we are very well positioned in that because you know cqt is one of the main poles in that sense so we get good students we have the name but it's a small country but you know, we're doing <laughs> admittedly <laughs> okay so so we are we are we are about 15 minutes away from the end of the, of the session so i want to make sure that we cover um uh, our final our final section of the discussion and also there's a lot of questions <laughs> so let's try to feel as many as possible so 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 going back to to uh demetrius what you just mentioned like in terms of, of of there being a lot of organizations all expanding into the realm of quantum right and i think just like how we saw it in the in the technology space you know about 10 15 years ago for for, for data science and all that talent right will continue to be a a, a huge issue for the, for the for the scale that quantum would need Right. And I think, I think till today, we haven't solved the issue of finding sufficient data scientists. We haven't solved the issue of finding, you know, sufficient people who understand can do AI, AI development. Right. So now, now we put quantum in the mix. Right. So how, how, what do you think is, is our role, right? As a, as, as, a, as someone like Nori from, from the commercial side, yourself from the academic side, and Peter as an as influencer, right? someone who, who, who writes, who writes important articles that people, people will actually read and, and, and be touched by to actually join the industry, right? How do we think about our roles in building up quantum future? And, and how can people do something tangible to move this along? You know, so mm. um, yeah, I would love to hear some of your thoughts around this. Uh, should I go and I'll, I'll, I'll let Peter start because- oh, I know, Peter, yeah. <laughs> because he's been, he's yeah. been, uh, he's been uh, you know, jealous of all, all our airtime, so. <laughs> no, I mean, again, I think I feel I may be the, uh, the least qualified to talk on this one. I mean, I'm glad that you mentioned quantum C-Tech, uh, Dimitris, because I mean, I think obviously money coming in, money and success are wound up in the VC industry and people see examples and, you know, some very, very clever people in VC, but also coming into the job market make they, they, they make bad decisions or good decisions on very dumb metrics and a company going going public and rising a thousand percent in one day it makes a difference actually people people notice and i think maybe you know, to be self-reflective that, that's what we need to do in the media right um mm. we need to explain this better it's exotic it's quite counterintuitive with the ideas embedded in it it's, it's so hard to explain um there is that instinctive fear in science out there um, that people don't don't want to understand or they don't understand, um, and that's going to come to this field as well. So I guess for us, self-servingly, the media has to get better at it. We have mm. to, and as you've seen in the pandemic, like right, we we need to have science and technology specialists in the newsrooms and on the editorial yeah. boards, and capable of understanding and explaining this. I think that's that's really all, all we can do. Yeah. Dimitris, uh, yeah. Um, definitely, we need. I mean. We need to re-educate or change the way we learn. I think it's a general issue. It's not only for quantum. It's, I think the whole way, the whole school system uh, in diff approaching science and, and different disciplines needs a bit of a more holistic and disciplinary approach. So to, to talk about quantum specifically, if you see um, um, some uh, recent efforts, the, the basic mathematics of quantum, the simple ones about qubits and, 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 and uh, superposition, I'm not talking about understanding a quantum experiment because there you need much more. You have to understand straight the equation. You have to take courses in quantum physics are pretty straightforward. I mean, you can even teach them in a high school level. Somebody understands vectors and matrices. And, you know, it's something that, uh, and more recently I see that coming more and more. And that is very good. Um, IBM has been doing a lot of work on that. And we also have been doing work with uh, 
with uh, local schools. There's the NUS High School, for example, the one of our colleagues wrote a book, Professor Scarani, I mean, himself and three students from the school about quantum uh, physics. Uh, there is a lot that can be done earlier on. We don't have to wait for quantum to, to enter, you know, at the graduate level. And, and mm -hmm. you need, um, that's in the education side. Uh, uh, now on the, on, on training and workforce side, uh, we need, uh, we need interface and we need high level language as well. And this is something that is happening these days. So programmers and people who, who know how to code don't need to spend five years learning deep quantum physics, but there is a catch there as well. Mm -hmm. Getting a kind of a, a, um, a programming language that allows you to play with a black box that gives you some exotic uh, uh, possibilities doesn't mean you really understand quantum. But this is good enough to, in the beginning, to, to, to make the field bigger and get mm -hmm. all these kind of whiz kids that can maybe design a quantum game that is very exotic and who knows, maybe we'll have an application later on. Mm -hmm. and, and then further up in the upstream, you, you, need, you need institutions and people like CQT to produce the really deep, hard research, which is very hard. Coming up with new quantum algorithms is not trivial. It's like, it's a different ball game. So we need the whole spectrum. And that's something that, you know, we have to, to do it, uh, collaborating with uh, governments, or some, uh, companies, institutions. There has to be a discussion about this at all levels. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And um, so there's many different, um, you know, type of uh, talents that we need. And I think the most uh, difficult talents, uh, they, the hard to find talent is the people to uh, develop the new quantum algorithms yet to be discovered. Those that need require the deep uh, scientific and uh, mathematical or you know theoretical uh, understanding of the physics as well as math, and so those are the pretty uh, deep side, pre which I, I think we don't have that many people uh, can do that. Uh, people at like the shores, uh, Grovers, you know those kind of a genius. We need a um, handful of them to to do that. Um, the other area I think they're very important, but also difficult, is to find the application side. Um, because you cannot grab the random banking people to come to say, hey, what kind of the computation that you think you can put on the quantum? You know, they, they may understand the bank uh, business, but not necessarily understand what uh, mathematically hard problems exist in the banking business, which you have to get to that level of knowledge and then have uh, some knowledge about these new tools that what can it be done differently from the classical computers. So this kind of the mix, or I, I should say technical uh, bilingual, knowing both the business and science for, uh, and to, can talk both. That kind of a people is what we need to educate and graduate, cultivate more. And for the rest of the community, like the programmers and uh, you know, application developers, those that, you know, as Dimitri mentions, um, in some cases, you don't, you don't even need to know about that too much detail about the scientific part of this game. Um, which uh, I think it's growing the number as well, but um, you know, uh, still we, we, we need more, but, um, but that's the case. They have different angles of uh, uh, talents that we need to develop. And each so gonna... uh, government uh, institution have uh, their role to, to do that. For sure. So I'm gonna, okay, I'm mindful of the time. Uh, we have a lot of good questions uh, here. And uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just jump straight into the questions. Um, I'll pick, I'll pick those that have the most number of upvotes, uh, and uh, I'll uh, if, if our panelists, if you guys can can can, can uh, try to be as concise and precise as possible uh, in your in your answers. So, first question is by RJ Maru. Uh, if according to Morimoto San, uh, if if quantum physics has been around for more than a century, if uh, right now classical people, if right now classical people are using non-classical tools, and if the big change will come when non-classical people use non-classical tools. What is preventing uh, people from becoming non-classical already? Yeah, because uh, I think the preventing from being that is the, our education. If a people more well-educated have a higher score in the classical computer world or classical physical world, it makes it more difficult to understand this new world because uh, mm. some of them are totally different than what we learned. And uh, I think the, you know, that kind of mental barrier is one way. Um, so that, that's why this, uh, you know, it's much easier for the quantum native group to come in and yeah. to start fresh from, from there. But still, you know, if you work harder, uh, classical people can be a non-classical. 
Next question. Uh, this should be fairly easy. Uh, what are the security issues raised by quantum computing technologies? <laughs> yeah, I can take it if, if the age doesn't. I mean, obviously, the ability to crack uh, crack um, encryption is pretty scary for a lot of, particularly for the banks. They worry that if you can crack any crack, crack encryption so quickly and with just basically brute force style cracking, then every piece of money, every kind of information flow around the world is compromised. I think when you talk to people in the strategic kind of world, the military and so on, they worry a lot about machine learning and the mm. ability to predict and, and manage in what they call the battle space. So can, um, can an, an enemy use the, the enormous computing power to understand exactly how, how, the, you know, how to move resources around and basically gain an advantage. Um, so they worry about that. Um, I'm sure there are others actually, Dimitri's probably better, to, better qualified to tell them, talk to you about them. So what was the question again? Sorry, uh, which one are we referring to? Uh, so the, the, the question was around kind of like, why, why are, what are security issues that are raised ah, yes, by yes, yes. technologies? Yeah, yeah I, think, I think Peter uh, answered very well. I mean, it's breaking cryptography, but I mean, figuring out your PIN every time you use your credit card. Right? <laughs> and and that, that uh, we need, uh, just to give a little bit more technical answer, the keys we're using now, like as this term knows, 1042 bits or 2048 bits, if you have, if source algorithms that everybody may have heard is implemented, we can break this. We can break this mm -hmm. in polynomial time and not uh, in, in, in years that it would take a classical computer. But we're still years away from that. Uh, mm -hmm. The hardware is not there yet. We need, we will need 10,000 qubits, roughly error corrected ones. And we have 50 to 100 at the moment, quite yeah. noisy ones. But, you know, we ne you never know the way that hardware is being evolving in the last uh, five years we might reach that. And quite a bit of uh, companies are very worried about that. And that's why they're getting interested to find ways to uh, uh, protect the information also. Because okay. where quantum cryptography comes in. So the next one should be fairly easy also. Um, uh, it's essentially quantum computing has challenges. Uh, and, and given such challenges, do you foresee uh, um, there being large scale adoption of quantum computers, uh, just like classical computers currently? Anyone? Uh, no, I, I think it will be uh, stay as a kind of a combination or hybrid system uh, combined with the classical computer and uh, quantum computer for a while. Um, you know, so you know because of the nature of uh, it's um, it's a it's delicate delicate uh, management and also the uh, it will not probably scale in that many large numbers of uh, quantum computer around the world. Instead, you know, few, several of those quantum computers attached to the high performance computer computer clusters uh, to kind of uh, being used as an offloading uh, function or uh, accelerator to drive those uh, complicated um, computation. I think that's the way to, to scale. Yeah. Um, I'm going to answer this one. Um, so in which industry or field uh, do you, the, the, the three of you feel that we will get the most benefit from quantum computing in the near future? Right. So is it finance? Is it chemistry? Is it defense? You know, so what is the first, you know, a um, uh, uh, commercializable go-to-market uh, uh, sequence? <laughs> um, it's hard to um, judge, right? I mean, benefit, mm. uh, it could be a scientific benefit or financial benefit. If you're talking about the money, uh, particularly, maybe financial industry. If they'll be able to um, better yeah. uh, way to calculate the risk and a better way to utilizing those uh, investment money going A to B and you know the money wise may be bigger. But I mm. think the scientific uh, discovery uh, to me uh, personally, I think that's uh, creating the much larger benefit to um, the society and human. Okay. And, and the next question is, uh, is, is going to be a combination of a couple of questions being asked. Right? I think with the current pandemic uh, and, and, and you know, the, 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 the financial uncertainty that's going to be coming in the next 12 to 18 months, right? um, many folks are concerned about jobs. Right? And in this case, you know, if someone was interested in quantum, what are the job prospects uh, within the quantum field? Are there specific areas that you think uh, you know, would be, would be uh, uh, lower hanging fruit? Um, yeah. Where do you see that going? So should someone like me, if I just came out of college, you know, and, uh, and, and oh, I love quantum, is there a job for me? <laughs> and, and if I do it now, you know, will I have a job in 10 years? Yeah, sorry. So, 
I can I can try in answering that, although okay. I'm not maybe the uh, optimal guy from from, from the panel. <laughs> but uh, well, come to CQT, ask for an internship. If you can code and you understand your mathematics, and and are you willing to to challenge yourself, approach us. Um, we have different levels of um, of entry points, uh, all the way from few weeks internships to research assistantships to even PhD programs, depending on your background. I think there are many startups and, and other institutions in the area that are looking for people, depending on their background, from software developers to full stack developers, all the way to more um, you know, data analytics, machine learning experts. Uh, it depends, again, your, your background. I, I mean, we have to say that quantum is not there yet. It's not like AI or machine learning, there's no jobs, prospects. It's, 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 it's a technology, it's a field that's growing. So, mm. but um, they're definitely, I think, more demand than, than, than hands at the moment. So I would say, you know, write to, to different people, including us at CQT, and, and we'll look around at the job adverts, you'll find quite different positions being advertised. That's a good, that's a good uh, go to action there. And, uh, uh, Nuri, you had something to say? Oh yeah, so, um, you know, whether you call it hype or not hype, um, as long as there's money flowing through that industry, there's always a job. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's uh, you know, some difference between the uh, country by country, uh, but um, definitely there's uh, interest of uh, you know, hiring or positions uh, for those people who are excited about that. And um, you know, sooner or later, you know, the, this machine is going to come to the real world. And um, you know, it won't hurt to know a little bit more about this new technology than other people, uh, you know, by the time you grow up. Right? So. Okay, so I know we are, we are out of time. One last question, guys, and this is, I, I find it interesting. Uh, quantum computing provides a solution for processing problems, but it does not provide a solution for data storage, right? Uh, and I you know as Dimitri earlier brought up, right, uh, yeah. uh, the, the, the rate of data growth is, is, is immense. Yes, yes, yes. So, yes. And we cannot store more, com more information with a quantum computer. So what is, what is the relevance of the amount of data being generated today? And uh, you know, are there practical solutions? Yes, yes. That... <laughs> That's a very good question. It's a very good question. And, and thanks, Mary, um, for asking it. Uh, uh, could be Mary from our, uh, from our uh, institution as well, because <laughs> the same name. Uh, it's a very good question because, the, okay, it's the following. We know how to process information. We know how to, uh, um, if we can load the data in the machine, and this is where the bottleneck is at the moment. If you have big data, even if you have a super, super uh, magic black box that processes data very fast using quantum subroutines, let's say in machine learning or clustering classification, you still need to load the data in the machine. And that's tough. We don't know how to do that yet. And the other thing we don't have is what's called a quantum RAM, a quantum random access mm -hmm. memory, experimentally. Mm -hmm. we know a lot of these algorithms that work uh, exponentially fast make that assumption, especially in the machine learning field, that you have a quantum RAM, that you can actually access the, 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 your quantum uh, uh, memory in a certain way. So um, practically, we, we can't solve that problem yet. Theoretically, there are algorithms that can process it, but we don't know how to implement at the moment optimally in, uh, um, in, 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 the, in the current hardware. Thank you, Dimitris. Um, so we have, we have five minutes over. Uh, <laughs> I would like to maybe, uh, unless there's any, to the panelists, you know, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, if you have any burning statements that you want to make about quantum in its future right now, please, please say it now, right? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I'll give you five seconds to raise a hand. Are you ready? You, yeah. Okay, uh, I'll let Nori san say something. <laughs> Just one last word. Um, you know, you, you have to be in there ocean to feel the way that's the one my, my last uh, word very nice and and you know <laughs> and, and i guess the three of you are at least, at least two of you are swimming in that ocean uh hopefully we get more swimmers to join you um i would love like to thank thank you guys so much for your time thank you to the participants we have lost very few people uh, throughout the session you know thank you so much for being here and for the great questions i'm sorry we can't answer all of it uh you know but but, but we can always engage in, in separate forums um thank you again have a great week ahead, you know, and, and, uh, and here's, here's to uh, quantum, you know, continuing to scale and grow uh, uh, within the world. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.